wants us to hear tonight. Brother Gary, would you stand and pray over the word tonight, over the preached word? Bibles, if you would, tonight to the book of Romans, chapter 13, part 2 of the message that we began this morning. I don't think that I've been whipped by a message any more than I was that one this morning, too. Uh, God just speaking to us, we need to watch what we think and how we project God's Word and God's kingdom what it's all about, why are we here, what would God say to us? And these verses of Scripture start out in the 13th chapter, and the title of the message is The Cry to Wake Up. The Cry to Wake Up, or The Wake Up Cry. In either way, we talked about that this is what Paul was saying here in Romans, that it is high time, high time. That's basically high time that is showing on that clock. High time for us to awake out of sleep. The time is high noon. We hear that term, high noon. That means that it is the, it is the pinnacle of the day. It is the turning point of the day. And he says here in verse 11, and that knowing the time, in fact, is, a, is what it's saying is that if you do know what time it is, that now is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand, let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in the rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's an unusual term you won't see very many times in the Bible. Lord Jesus Christ. All the terms of Jesus are mentioned here. We're going to talk about it in the latter part of this message. And make no or make not provisions for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. If you take out the italicized words, which is feel words, they're words put in in order to bring those words together, make not provisions for the flesh to lust. Don't give your body an opportunity to lust. And so when we understand, as we did this morning, what God is saying to us, that it is high time that we awake, there has to be a cry. Somebody's got to be awake. Somebody's got to declare the word. Somebody has got to preach it and shout it because this is not a time for us to preach little sermonettes, but it ought to be a cry out to wake up, wake up, wake up. We know that there are, well, were three things that we talked about, and these were mentioned by Vince Hefner, the great evangelist and pastor of past days. 
And he said that these are the three things. There is anarchy in the world, there is apostasy in the church, and there's apathy in the pews. Anarchy meaning that there is lawlessness, that anything to go against what God has is going on in the world. Apostasy is the fact of backsliding in the church, turning back, going back after that you have known God. Apostasy is the falling away and to going back on God. Apathy, of course, is just the simple fact that we sit and we feel comfortable and so we say, who cares? We, we're not concerned. It's not yet time to act. We keep seeing the envelope being pushed. And though we are seeing the envelope pushed, we always are saying, well, it still will turn around. It still could get better. Let's just wait. Let's just watch. And so we become comfortable and just sitting. But here is the cry. Hey, hey, folks, time has run out. Yeah, I didn't say time was running out. Time has run out. And we're living on, we're living on mercy right now. If there could be anything that could be said about this hour, it is a grace time, mercy time, that God has extended the time because it's, it is well over the appointed time. The moral tide of, uh, that is sweeping our nation, the, uh, the, the very tide of, of immoral uh, decadence that is, that is pressing upon everybody and everywhere in and every situation. And we talked about the enemy is awake. The enemy is not sleeping. But since the time of Satan's outcast from being thrown out of heaven, he's been working up to this hour. This is going to be, listen now, this is going to be his finest hour before it becomes his most horrifying hour because he's going to take, the Bible says that that people will by the thousands fall and worship him. This is, the, this is the hour he's been working for. But it is this time that the church is called for to wake up, do not sleep. Because of the fact that there is apostasy in the church we no longer identify with the name of Jesus. We're grossly proud, or, or grotesquely proud. We've abandoned our defense, which is prayer. We come to church and say, why don't God move? And the whole time is we've not been praying and we've not been doing the things he said that we're to do. When and the Bible speaks of it doesn't matter how bad it gets with how bad Satan gets. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the Bible said God would raise a standard against him. And we know that there is power in the name of Jesus, but we have replaced seeking with sneaking. We don't seek after God. We sneak around and try to find where God's moving, and we want to slip in on it. Instead of getting on our face and doing what God says, we turn the house of God the church of God into everything but what it's appointed and called to be. And that is a place of prayer, a place of preaching, and a place of preparation. That's what the church is. That brings us up to tonight's message, and that is the, the second point that I want to make to you, is it is later than you think. He said in verse 11, and that knowing the time, that now is the high time to awake out of sleep. We go on to verse 13. We are, this is the time. The darkness has had its day. There is much going on, but God's called us to wake up. Get up, because it's later than you think it is. 
First of all, I want you to look at me. There are three things that I say about the late hour. Number one, it's later in human history than it has ever been, and that's just a natural statement. That applies anywhere you go, but the truth is that we are further alone in world history than you think we are. Do you know there are preachers still in the pulpit today that will talk about, well, we may have another 100 or 200 years? There are those that believe that we may even have five, six, seven hundred more years. But the fact is that we have run the history clock out. It's later in human history than you think. Why do I say that? It's because at this very hour, we've lived to see the day when the sins of the whole world are openly expressed and there is nothing hid used to be that there were closet sinners, and the closets were full of sinners, but there are no closets anymore. The closets are empty, and the public has become the place to display the sins that at one time was one time kept in secret and in silence, sins that have attracted such an effect upon our young people that within their grasp, every one of our young people that have a cell phone or an iPad has access to every kind of sin that you can think of. And to think that there is a way you can cover and keep them as long as they have those instruments, I'm telling you, they have a way because Satan has the ability to bypass Whatever it is that you think you put up a guard, he'll bypass it in order to reach your children. He'll bypass it in order, it's not just children, it is everybody. It's later in history than you would ever believe. I never would have believed I would have lived to see the hour that I'm living, seeing now with the advancements in science, the advancements in technology, the advancements that we are seeing today, that we are in the last hours. We're not just in the last quarter. We're not just in a two-minute warning session. We have seen that clock until we think, well, Lord, it's already past the hour, but God in his grace has given us another chance to wake up. I don't want to pass up one more opportunity to declare the word of God. I want to be, every time I walk in this pulpit, I don't want to just be your pastor. I don't want to just be a preacher. I want to be an evangelist with a cry out to everyone that will hear my voice. It is high time we wake up because it's late later in human history than you think it is. Not only is it later in human history, it's later in your life than you think it is. I said it's later in your life. We heard the opening, and this was not by coincidence. This was, a, I think, a divinely led of God, this whole service. Every song went a certain way with a certain theme. Brother Webb, as he opened the service tonight, was talking about how that he lay down on his bed and thinking to himself, is this the night? Is this the night when I close my eyes and sleep that I will never wake again on this side of eternity? When you hear and feel and are sensitive to the fact that something's wrong, those things make you aware that it's later in life than you think. I just cannot believe that I've reached the age that I've reached so rapidly, so quickly, because only yesterday I was a teenager. Only yesterday I was preaching revivals when I was still in high school. Only yesterday was I a kid running around playing ball and doing all those other things that children do, and almost at the snap of a finger that I'm at the place I am today, and so are you. But I want to tell you something. It's later in your life than you think it is. 
Somehow because you've lived so long, you just have this tendency to believe that as things have been, so shall things be. But let me tell you something. You need to awaken to the fact that if you are going to do something in your life, you better do it now. Not only is it later in life, the Bible says in the book of James, chapter 4, and verse number 14, whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? What is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time, and then it vanishes away. We don't know how close we are to eternity. And the third thing is, it's later in the day of opportunity. It's later in the day of opportunity. How many windows of your life has closed in the house of your existence, in the rooms of your life, how many doors have been shut forever to never go back into those rooms again? How many windows of opportunity are closed? And as you look around your house and see your physical condition and, and see your limitations and see the time frame, how late is it for you to have opportunity to serve God. This is the year, this is the time, this is the hour that whatever you are able to do, re-examine yourself based upon your ability to do something for God. Don't continue your life just, just going as it is. Think about the fact that if I ever do anything if there is ever an opportunity for me to do any kind of ministry, when am I going to do it? When, when will that time come? If I ever do anything, if I ever preach, if I ever sing, if I ever develop the ministry that I feel in my heart God wants for me, when am I going to do it? Do I have a call of God to speak and, and preach to youth and to children? How long will you wait until that opportunity is gone? It's later in opportunities than you think. Grasp a hold with everything you can. John chapter 9 and verse 4. In John 9 and 4, Jesus said, I must work the work. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. Is it 3 o'clock in the afternoon for you? Is it 5 o'clock in the afternoon? As the sun began to set, you know that as soon as you see the sun on the, on the evening horizon, that you see it there for a moment, and you think, well, the sun's still up. And you can only go five or ten minutes longer and that sun that brought brightness to your life is now set behind the horizon. Now this may be something that you, 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 you've thought about and you, you may not have thought about it at all. But if the sun is setting on your horizon, please ask God before this service is over tonight, God, what would you have me to do? Give me your will. Give me your plan. Let me work for you, God. I want to ask you something. How many of us tonight, we talked about the armor of God and putting on the whole armor of God. And from the breastplate of righteousness to our feet being shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, having our shoes on. Look at me right now. Let me ask you something. How many of you want to die with your shoes on? How many of you want to die with your shoes on? Your spiritual shoes on, saying, I'm working. I'm involved in the labor of God. Do you want to die sitting in a recliner 
with your feet up and your shoes off and enjoying the last part of your life? Do you want to enjoy the last part of your life by sitting on a bank somewhere fishing and saying, this, this is what I've worked for all my life? Or will you put your shoes on and say, if I die, I'm going to die with my shoes on. I'm going to be doing something for God. I'm going to be behind a pulpit. I'm going to be somewhere praising God. That's how my grandmother died. My grandmother Kelly was a little short lady, and, 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 and uh, she was a fireball for God. She served God when not a member of her house was saved. She cried and called on God, prayed for them, fasted for them. Her, her husband was rather mean to her. And many, many times he would not even let her take the, the, the horses and the buggy to go to church. A lot of times she had to get on that old gravel road and walk for miles to get to church. But it was there in the church. It was there leading a prayer, a, a, a testimony service one night as she stood behind the pulpit and was declaring what God was, how good God was, and what God could do. That as she was standing there with a grip on that pulpit and saying, the things of God that she went home to be with the Lord. And listen to me, I don't know a better way to go to meet God than to go with my shoes on saying, God, here I am. I'm going to walk the last mile. I'm not going to have somebody push me over the line. I'm not going to have somebody to roll me across the line. I'm going to walk across the line with my shoes on serving God with everything I've got. Come on, somebody. Is anybody willing to do that for God? Get up and get your shoes on. That'd be a sermon right there by itself, wouldn't it? We got too many saints with sandals on. We got too many saints with house shoes on. I wish everybody'd kick those house shoes off tonight. Let's get out and get our feet dirty. Let's be working for God. Let's do something. God didn't call you to retire. Uh, now, you may retire from this world and doing stuff, but God never, God's kingdoms never has a retirement pro program. I heard a preacher one time say, well, you know, being a pastor is uh, pretty rough for being a preacher because you, you have no retirement. You have no benefits. And somebody spoke up and said, oh, preacher, you're wrong. You're wrong because your retirement is out of this world. Amen. <laughs> Amen. There will come a time when I'll retire, and that will be whenever he calls me home. And I'll kick these old worldly shoes off, and I'll put on those, those street-walking shoes of heaven, and the first step I make will be on streets of gold, and the first hand I shake will be the hand of the Redeemer who saved me, and I'll see the glory of the heaven. Thank God I want to walk out of this world right into glory land because of the presence and the power of the Almighty God. I wish somebody would help me preach in this house tonight. My Lord, this is what we have to know, that it's later, it's later in the day. Well, thank you, Holy Ghost. That wasn't in my notes. That just come out fresh. Hallelujah. There are three things to do in this last hour that's shown right here in this, these lessons and these words. There are three things, and here they are. Number one, it's time to wake up. What do you mean, preacher, wake up? Well, I thought we were awake. <laughs> if you really could see spiritually, awakeness and sleepiness, and then determine what are we, where are we, we need to be awakened. When it says to wake up, time to wake up, it's time to come out of dream world. Because most of us, that's where we are. We're dreaming of the past. We're dreaming that everything's just lovely and beautiful. But we need to wake up. We're not only to come out of the dream world. I want to tell you something. Now listen to me. This is where it gets tough. How many of you know the worst part about waking up in the morning? Now, some of you, I know that you've been getting up at 4 and you've been getting up at 3 and some of you get up at 1 o'clock in the morning. I mean, that's just. But 
how many of you know that the hardest thing to get up and get awake is your body, your flesh? Your mind says, get up. Your body says, shut up. Come on now. Your mind says, I'm going to hit the floor running, and your body says, oh, yeah, right. Go without me. We, we can't get our old bodies awake. And somebody said, well, you know what we need in our church is a Holy Ghost move of God. We need a real genuine power from heaven. But I want to tell you something. The only way we'll do it is that we're going to have to get our flesh up. We're going to have to get our flesh awake. And some of you are hearing in your spirit, but you can't get your flesh to do what you need to do. You need to shake yourself. The Bible says that's what Samson did, you see. He fell asleep. He fell asleep in the, in the lap of a woman, Delilah. And when he woke up, he tried to get his body awake. And so he got up and he shook his body. Wake up, body. Wake up, but he found that his body would not respond anymore because it had been chained and he'd lost the power. He'd lost the anointing. And let me tell you something. It's time the church wake up, but we got to get some body into this thing. We got to become awake freshly. We've been imprisoned so much by sins. We've been imprisoned by our own selfishness. We've been put in prison until our bodies don't have the move of God anymore. We need to get the Spirit of God until there is a shaking in our body. Hallelujah. Mm. I come out of the old, I come, somebody said something and was, was some scripture and I come out of the office this morning and I was singing the ankle bones connected to the shin bones the shin bones connected to the Knee bone, the knee bone's connected to the thigh bone, the thigh bone's connected to the hip bone. The, the word of the Lord will get awake, old body. Shake yourself. Let's go. Let's hear what God has to say. We need to, we need to come to the church and do some calisthenics in the spirit, and we need to shake this old body, and we need to say, you've got to get awake and the sins that's held you down. You see, the Bible says that we're to lay aside every sin and weight that does so easily beset us so that we can run with patience the the, the call of the run of God with patience. I've got that all messed up. But anyway, you know the gist of the scripture. I'm going to use a Biden here, I guess, for a minute. You know what I'm saying. <laughs> but we've got to get our bodies awake. We come to church, and you know what the most of us look like? We're good out yonder. We're good out there in the world. We're good when we're rounding cattle. We're good when we're messing with the goats. We're good when we're out here driving and doing stuff. We walk in the house of God and our bodies just shut down. Come on. You say, come on, somebody, praise the Lord. Oh, praise the Lord. Come on. This morning, I couldn't even get you to raise your hand when you got mad at your clock. I had two people raise their hand. Amen. Then I, then I ask everybody that gets mad at the rooster when he wakes you up. Nobody was mad at the rooster breaking them up. But the truth is, we need to come into the house of God with enthusiasm. Enter his gates with what? Huh? Thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Can somebody recognize that you're in the courthouse of God and can somebody praise him in this house tonight? My Lord, you say, well, I just ain't doing That's not me, preacher. I just don't do that. But you watch somebody make a score in a basketball game and you're on your feet and you got your hands in the air and you say, yeah, that's my grandbaby there. That's my baby doing that. Come on. I want to tell you something. It's time we act like that God's doing something for us and somebody praise him. Somebody give him some glory when we come to the house of God. We need an awakened people in God's house. Come on. 
Well, what does it do? Well, stirring stirs others. Let me go on. I'll, I'll be here all night. The flesh is the last thing to respond. Wake up. If you're going to wake up, go ahead and get up. What happens to you when you wake up, but you don't get up? What happens? You go back to sleep. And I want to tell you, every time we have a revival, come on, Brother Lonnie. I need some amens from over there. That's a corner. You two guys back there, my goodness, throw something at me or something. Just let me know. You know what? Every time we have revival, the alarm clock goes off. Everybody gets excited, but nobody gets up. So a week later, we all sleep again. And we ask, did we just have revival? I thought everybody got excited. I thought everybody's alarm was, went off. And everybody's, man, I'm excited about it. But you didn't get up. You didn't get up. What do you mean get up, preacher? It means that you've got to change your position. You've got to go from where you are, and you see your flesh won't do it. You've got to make your flesh obey because you might be sitting there tonight saying, well, I'm not going to do anything I don't feel like doing. Well, you won't get up in the morning if you don't do beyond what you feel like because you feel like just keep laying there. Get up. Not only does the Bible say that we are to get up or wake up, it's time to clean up. Listen to what he says. Romans chapter 13, verse number 14, or verse number, verse number 12. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chamberings and wantonness, not in strife and envy. Those right there, there are six things. There are six things that we're to clean up if we're going to become people of the day. If we're going to, if we're going to hear the alarm and get up, the, the six things are listed in pairs. They're listed in pairs. First of all, it says rioting, riots and drunkenness. Riots and drunkenness. Riots and drunkenness. It is the fact that we are participating in the world, in the things of the world. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness. The second set is chamberings and, and wantonness. Chamberings is sexual sins of any type and any kind. It is participation in pornography. It's participation in adultery. It's participation in living together without being married. It is participation in anything that God says is wrong. That we, the chamberings and the, the sexual sins, the wantonness. You know what the wantonness is? He said, you're going to have to clean yourself of this stuff. The wantonness is without shame, without shame. We're living in an hour that not only in the world, but in the church, people have no shame. You see people walk down the street, women can dress in the most provocative means and ways. They have no shame. It doesn't matter how little they have it, on them. It doesn't matter what kind of situation it is, is, whether there are children present or whatever people openly display their sins. We're living in an hour when there is wantonness, there is constant display of the shameful sins of the world. But there must be a cry out that the church has got to cleanse itself from that sins. They've got to come apart from that world. Don't be in that world. Don't be a part of that world. Because if you do, you're going to defile yourself. Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse number 15 says it like, like this. In Jeremiah 6 and 15, were they ashamed when they had committed abominations? Nay, they were not at all ashamed, neither could they blush. Therefore, they shall fall among them that fall. At the time that I visit them, they shall be cast down. 
because there's no shame, because we look at the world and we see what's going on, and we're not ashamed either. We're not ashamed of our sins. Isaiah chapter 3 and verse 9 says it this way. The shoe of their countenance does witness against them, and they declare their sins as Sodom. They had it not. Woe unto their soul, for they have rewarded evil unto themselves. We've got, we've got preachers that stand in the pulpit today, and they openly confess themselves to be homosexuals. We've got people that declare themselves, the Bible says, that they'll act just like, and they'll, they'll display themselves as the men in Sodom did, because there is no shame in them. The homosexuality, the gay and lesbians, the, the numbers of the letters that they place out there to say that's a, that's a protected group, that is a, a, that's now pride, you're, you're, you're prideful if you're a part of that that community, but the truth is the Word of God says that it's abomination and it will bring shame, but the church needs to pray. We need to get right with God. Not only is riot and drunkenness and chambering and wantonness, but the Bible says cleanse yourself from strife and envy. Strife. Strife is wanting power over someone else. Is striving to dominate. It doesn't matter whether it is the fact that you've got better gossip than they got. You want to control what they're thinking. You want to strife is building up something to overpower someone else and to control strife and envy, wanting what other people have. Desiring to have what other people have is a sin. And the Bible said, he said, not only wake up and get up, but he also said, clean up, get clean, get yourself right with God. How often should we pray for cleansing, preacher? <clears throat> How often should we pray for God to baptize us afresh with his anointed word and the water of the word to cleanse us? It ought to be daily. It ought to be daily. We need a constant cleansing, but it, it amazes me. It amazes me that I can be in service and I can be preaching, and I've preached here so many messages already, and to see the lack of response. And you say, well, I don't feel like I need to go to the altar. But, folks, I want to tell you, if this congregation would follow the precepts of what the Word of God declares, if my people, which are call by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from the wicked ways. Why won't we do that? You know what concerns me the most, Brother Frank? If we don't do it in church, you're not going to convince me you're doing it at home. Amen. Right here where God's, God's presence and God's word and you say, well, I'm not under conviction, or I did, that didn't apply to me. These altars ought to be saturated with prayer in every service. It just needs to. You see, that goes back to the old flesh. We don't want to wake up. We want to come and receive and get filled and go home. Nobody wants to stay and do the dishes. Boy, got quiet. Can I get an amen somewhere? <laughs> Folks like to come and enjoy a meal and say, see you later. But who wants to stay and wash the dishes? That's pretty good, Holy Spirit. I never thought about that. But I think that's the way it is. We all come and we want a good preaching message. We want something to stir us. We want something to shake us. We want to say, man, that was, I enjoyed that tonight. That, or today, that was so good or whatever. But nobody wants to stay. You say, what do you mean, wash the dishes? Come down and pray for the operation of God to be complete with that word. Amen. 
Write that down, sissy. I'll, I don't have a pen. I'd write it down. Everybody wants to come to church and get full, but they don't want to wash the dishes. <laughs> let, me, let me finish up with this. Not only are we to get up and clean up, but the Bible says we're to dress up. Verse number 14, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. I love that. Write this down. What are we to dress? We're to put on a three-piece suit. A three-piece suit. That's what we ought to put on after we've repented and cleaned up. What is that three-piece suit? Lord Jesus Christ. Marvelous when you see those three together in a sentence. Normally it's Lord Jesus or Jesus Christ, but here it's all three. What do you mean, Lord Jesus Christ? First of all, put on the Lord. What is the Lord? That means that, you see, a lot of people don't want to put this part of the armor on. This is the part you need the most because, and it puts it first. Put this on first, the Lord. What does it mean to put the Lord on? It means you acknowledge he is master. For the Lord means master means that he's in control of you. And every day of your life, when you pray and repent, you need to put the Lord on to say, it's not my call. You're the Lord of my life. Not only are we to put the Lord on, we're to put Jesus on every day. What is Jesus? He's the Savior. For his name should be called Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus, Savior, Jesus, Savior. Why do I need Jesus as my Savior daily? I took him as a Savior way back there. But you see, every day of your life, you're going to face some stuff that you need a Savior. You need somebody to save you from that day. Amen. To save you from that situation. Not only are we put on the Lord Jesus but do we to put on Christ? Oh, I wish I had time to preach right here. I'd love to just write some of this stuff that I'm feeling in my spirit. The Lord, Master, Jesus, Savior, Christ, the anointed. Put on the anointing of God. You were a king's kid. You've been redeemed by God, and you're called to have an anointing upon you. Jesus said, for the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. Amen. We need the anointing of God. We need that part of, we need the Christ, the anointed one in us. We need to have the power. That's the glory of God. That's the anointing. That's the Shekinah. That's the glory that moves and operates and takes us and keeps us. We need the Holy Ghost on our lives today. Christ, the anointed one. Ha, the three-piece suit. And then the last part says, and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Make no provision. Do you know what that could mean? That could mean that you got a prescription when you broke your arm, some pain pills, that the doctor gave you to help you through that little crisis. But somehow or another, that old arm never did get totally feeling good. And you keep calling and saying, Doctor, I need another, I need another round of, of those good feel-good pills. If you would, and the doctors will just gladly write it out to you. And you're saying, well, Lord, I need, to, I need to get off of these things. I don't need to be taking these pain pills all the time. And you don't, how is it that you make no provision for the flesh? You ask God to deliver you from it, and you flush those things down the commode. Don't put them in the back of the closet somewhere in case you just have to have one because you make provision for it. If you've been an alcoholic and you say, God, I want you to deliver me, but I'm going to keep this six-pack in the back of the refrigerator just in case that something happens and I need a cold one. You don't make provisions for the 
the flesh. You, if you're trying to get free, get free. He'll make you free indeed. If you're wanting to get rid of cigarettes out of your life and you've been smoking two or three packs a day and God delivers you, don't keep a carton laying around somewhere hidden out of sight because if you do, you're going to make provision. It'll be there. And I want to tell you something, whatever it is in your life, if you got a problem with pornography, you've got to cut some stuff off. You've got to get rid of some stuff and you can't have it available so you can go back to it. Make no provision for the flesh and the lust thereof. What have you still got hanging around? A lot of folks have entered their marriage that way just in case. Come on. And those just in case marriages always winds up a case in court. Amen. Don't make provisions. If you got married and you're in a marriage, you don't have a contract, you got a covenant. So there ought to be something you get rid of in your life, and that is the possibilities of divorce. It just don't exist. Come on, folks. I preached, I preached long enough. I preached about 40 minutes. How about your life? How many of you heard something this weekend that you know can help you through the coming weeks if you will just take what God says? And let's walk with it. Keep these verses of Scripture. I don't know who it was. I, I, I think it was Chad this morning who said that you need to memorize some Scripture. You say, I can't memorize. Yeah, well, yes, you can. You can sing it. Just sing it. Just start singing it. If you start singing the Word, it'll be pretty soon. It'll be like any other song. You'll, you'll memorize it. Make more provision. Make provision for God. Come on to the piano. Now, I don't preach. I don't. I don't preach all the spirit away. <laughs> and, and you're just sitting there, and your old flesh is is half asleep. And some of you just need to shake your flesh. You need to get it awake, and you need to say, "Here I am, God. I'm here in this thing." How many would? It would at least do this. Would you go back to your closet and get those shoes of the gospel of peace and put them on and say, God, I'm dressed for the road. I'm going back to work for you with all that I have because time is up. The alarm has gone out. Are you ready? Are you ready? Just bow your head where you are. and I'm not going to make it easy for you, but if God dealt with you and you need to make some changes in your life, and you know that God has spoken and you say, Preacher, I'm not sure I'm all awake that I need to be, but I'm going to walk out of this service tonight awake, awakened. My flesh is going to get awake. I'm tired of being half asleep. I want a move of God in my life. These altars open for you. We need to we need to saturate this place with prayer. So I'm going to ask you to just get up out of where you're seated. I'm not ashamed of this. I'm just going to ask you to come. And say, God, here I am. Here I am. I want to pray for my church that we have a Holy Ghost revival that will stir the hearts of men God, I want, a, I want a move of God in our church. Humble ourselves, pray, seek his face. Turn and hear God tonight. Right there in that altar. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.